we had gotten down to verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 25. But because it's been a while, I thought I would go back to verse 1 and at least give my heading of that section and uh, read through it. In the first five verses, I have it titled, A Hymn of Thanksgiving for the Deliverance Spoken Of. And he says, O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a, a heap, of a defensed city a ruin, a place of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat of the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. Then in verses 6 through verse 8, I have it titled as Great Blessings in Jerusalem. And he says that in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of uh, wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all te or wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off, from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And if you recall last time as we discussed those verses. It does, well, verse, as you see uh, at the start of that in verse 6, that it's the mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto his all people. Well, the mountain is the church, and thus these blessings that he's talking about are blessings that we have in the church. Uh, they are spoken of, obviously, from a figurative standpoint, but there's still great blessings in being a member of the church. And a lot of times we don't uh, realize those blessings. Uh, we have great hope for heaven and we think of the blessings that we will receive in heaven, and it is going to be a place that is far beyond any way in which we d can describe it. But the blessings that he's talking about here are blessings that we have now in the church, uh, which you know, a lot of times we think, well, there's no real di big difference between the person in the world who lives a good moral life and all of that and the person who's a member of the church. Well, that's so false. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have blessings that they, they don't understand. They cannot comprehend. 
because they do not enjoy those blessings. Um, and some of those statements that we find here for, especially in verse 8, um, Lord God shall, uh, will wipe away tears from off all faces. We think of that as something that we have to look forward to in heaven. Uh, but in reality, it's talking about the church. Now, how can that be? Well, because we have those spiritual blessings. And we can, with those spiritual blessings, and he's talking spiritually here. He's not talking about from a physical standpoint. We rejoice in the Lord, well, most of the time. No, we rejoice in the Lord always. Well, what's the difference between saying rejoice in the Lord always and saying God's going to wipe away all tears? And that's the point. They don't understand that peace that passeth all understanding. That, uh, they're miserable because they don't have it. They don't understand it. Uh, and that's what you've expressed many times in relationship to the teacher there at, uh, what was it? Headmaster at School 15. The only joy she had was when she went home and got vodka and got drunk. Uh, wash away all of what she thought was her problems. Just drown them in alcohol. Well, that doesn't. But the Christian has that peace that passes all understanding. And notice the next statement. What is it? Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we have that. We have that rejoicing all the time because of the relationship that we have with God because we can take all of our cares and cast them at his feet. So there are great blessings being a Christian, being in the church. And how does Paul express it in Ephesians 1.3? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if you look at that phrase, uh, it's actually in the heavenlies. Uh, and if you look at that phrase, heavenlies, you see that as it's used in both Ephesians, but as in particular you see it in the book of Hebrews, it has reference to the church. So he could have put all spiritual blessings in the church in Christ. There's a lot of passages that would uh, refer to that. I would actually go back a few verses before that to the fact that in the churches you see the manifold wisdom of God being exhibited. Uh, but there's a lot of passages that deal with that same idea. Um, So now then, uh, in verse 9 through verse 12, you have that Israel, or I have it as Judah, rejoices, but Moab uh, suffers. There's a contrast that is being made here. And it says that in 
And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The phrase in that day is always understood by context. It can have reference to numerous things. Uh, here, it's what Isaiah has just written in the preceding verses, verses 6 through verse 8, and the great blessings that we have in the church. And thus, the, in that day, dealing with the Christian age, that entire dispensation is referred to. So in the Christian dispensation, those who have waited for him, we have waited for him. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. And specifically waited for him in the salvation that he gives. Now what does it mean to wait for him? Waited for him. Used twice there, but what does it mean? We use the term as just simply you kind of do nothing and wait. Sit there and wait. Uh, that's not what it's having reference to. It's a placing of one's trust in God to do and to accomplish what he says he's going to do and do it in the time frame in which he sets forth. A lot of times, well, I'll just go. Uh, you remember in Hebrew, not in Revelation, where those under the altar are crying. You remember what they're crying? How long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? In other words, they wanted it right then. And basically, just wait and trust in God. He will avenge your blood, but he's got his own time frame. Place your trust in him to do it, even though it might not be within your time frame. Um, how many times do we want God to avenge us right now? You know, do something. Uh, I can imagine those of the first century as, and the succeeding generation, or centuries, first two, three centuries of the church, as they underwent horrendous persecution. And no doubt they they wanted God to do something. Uh, wait on God. Allow him to do what he says he's going to do in the time frame in which he's going to do it. You just trust in him. That's the idea of waited for him. Now then, if you go back to what he's talking about, and he will save us, Go back all the way to the creation. Adam and Eve, placed in that beautiful garden, they commit sin, and God promises a son who would destroy the power of Satan. 
Now then, we don't know how many years it was from that time frame to the time in which Christ came. But can you imagine all of those individuals wanting that salvation, desiring that salvation? Uh, someone turn over to... Uh, and at First Peter 1, and uh, let's see, I think it's verses, uh, 10 through about verse 12, where he talks about, here's the salvation. What is that? He will save us. Which salvation? The prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of spirit of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Notice that? The manner of time when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow on whom it was revealed not unto themselves, but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And notice this also. Which things the angels desired to look into. And if you look at that idea of desire, it is an intense scrutiny that they are giving. They wanted to know about these things, and they didn't know. And here's the prophets. They're prophesying of the salvation that's going to come. They didn't understand it. They didn't know about it. Um, that which Jason has been going through on Sunday mornings in Isaiah 53. What did the Ethiopian say when Philip comes up to him? How can I understand this? Unless somebody show it to him. Is he talking about Israel? Is he talking about, what's he talking about? They didn't understand it. Even Isaiah probably didn't understand it, is what we're seeing here in 1 Peter 1. They had a hand in bringing all of it out, and they still didn't understand it. Uh, so, allow God... And you can say this during Isaiah's day, allow God to bring this salvation in his time. Somebody read Galatians 4 and verse 4, and what does it say? In the fullness of time, God sent forth a son made of a woman made under the law. Okay, in the fullness of time. In other words, God was working everything together so that it would be the perfect time in which to send his son. What is it? We have waited for him, and he will save us. Now then, we could enter into a study as well in relationship to the blood of Christ. What happens? It goes back to cover those under the, the Old Testament period. That's what Hebrews 9 verses... Uh, 15 through 17 is teaching us. As well as, we generally think of the blood of Christ coming forward to cover our sins, but we seldom think of it as going back to cover the sins of the Old Testament. And yet, that's what, what it was doing. What was it? Waiting for him to save us. Waiting for the, and he was waiting for the fullness of time. In other words, everything to develop to where it was the perfect time to send his son. And you can talk about economically, you can talk about socially, you can talk about from a political standpoint, you can talk about uh, travel, you can talk about all, any aspect that you want to look at, it was the perfect time in which to send his son. Linguistically, we oftentimes, that's oftentimes studied or mentioned. All of those things, God was working it out. 
surely know their strength. Uh, God will strengthen you. Trust in God to do what He says. Now, it may not be in our time frame that we want it to be, but He will do it. Now, all of this salvation, of course, is found in Christ. Uh, someone read Acts 4 and verse 12. Okay, none other name under heaven. Salvation comes through Christ, Him only. Uh, how foolish some of the denominational world is, much of the denominational world, to put their trust in man instead of Christ. Uh, people like putting their trust in the Pope or Joseph Smith or Muhammad, or Confucius, and all of these others that people place their trust in to save them. Um, now then, we realize that salvation when we're then baptized into Christ. And... What are the only two passages in the Bible that tell us how to get into Christ? I don't think anybody but me might have heard that. <laughs> Galatians 3 and verse uh, 26, no, 27. And then Romans 6 and verse 3. Those are the only two passages that tell us how to get into Christ. Well, Christ is the one who is our Savior. He's going to be that one who saves us. It's important to get into Him to where that salvation is. Um, I always forget which one is which, so I'll mention both of them. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and verse 10. One of them says that the grace that is in Christ Jesus, there's no grace outside of Christ from a spiritual standpoint. And the other one says the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's no salvation. There's no grace. Let me kind of take a, an aside in that regard. Have you ever heard Christians telling someone who's lost a loved one and that loved one's not a Christian, but something along the lines that, well, he is, God is a merciful God and God's you know, show great and things like that? No. The only place where grace is found is in Christ. And if he's, that person's not in Christ, he has no grace. He has no access to it. There is no mercy for that individual. Now that may sound harsh, and you certainly wouldn't want to tell that loved one that. But we need to be careful not to leave the impression that God's going to extend grace to that individual because he's not. That person is without grace, has no grace. Just like he has no salvation because he was not in Christ. Uh, oh, yes, those are two of the big statements. Uh, they're not in pain anymore. In no way, they're in greater pain than anything that they could ever suffer here in this world. They're in a better place. No, they're not. They're in torments. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches, at least. Now, and, and I'll qualify this. We certainly don't want to shut the door to trying to teach someone by being crude and crass in our statements but we don't have to lie to them either. Uh, 
a lot of times when someone has lost a loved one, you don't have to say anything. Your presence there is enough. That's, that's what's important. And say, uh, you can remember the good times that the person has had. Uh, yeah. They have escaped this world, and now then they are in a much better place. That's the Christian. The one who's not a faithful Christian, he doesn't have that. Uh, so the salvation that this is talking about will be it produces joy glad rejoice in his salvation uh, someone turn over to the 118th Psalm and read verses 23 and 24. Psalm 118, 23, and 24. A lot of times we hear that in relationship. Well, this is a day that the Lord's made. Well, in a sense, yes. But we're talking about is salvation that we have. That in Christ we have this joy and we, we can rejoice. We can be glad in it. Because we have salvation in Christ. Uh, remember 2 Corinthians uh, 6 and verse 2 that is used so often in invitations that, uh, that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Uh, well, he talking about the day, of, yes, of salvation from the standpoint we have salvation in Christ. Now, we shouldn't delay our obedience to that because we need to be enjoying that salvation in this world. And you never know what tomorrow holds. So in that sense, yes, today is the day. But he's talking about the day of the Christian dispensation and that day of Christ in which salvation comes. We can rejoice and be glad in it. Um, when one obeys the gospel then, what happens? Well, look in Acts, the second chapter. And these were Jews who thought they were in a, you know, they were God's children. They had all of the blessings that God gives. Never in bondage to anyone, you know, they boasted. And yet, when they heard the gospel preached, as many as gladly received the word were baptized. There's a joy that's there. They gladly received it. Why? Because they enjoyed the salvation now that comes from this day, the day of Christ. And Acts, the eighth chapter, with the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, after his baptism, what, what happened? He went on his way rejoicing. He now experienced the joy that's found being a Christian. See the same thing with the Philippian jailer in Acts the 16th chapter. So we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Uh, one of the sad things for Christians, and I'll put it that way, is to express to a world that we are m miserable of some for some reason. Uh, there's the story, and I'm a rotten storyteller, so I'm not going to tell it right. I'll give you the highlights. A couple of young people. 
one of them's a Christian and the other one's not lived an ungodly lifestyle. And kind of expressing to the Christian, why should I become a Christian? Look at all of the things you miss out on. I can go and do this, I can do that. You can't do that. What good is Christianity, in effect? Well, they had missed all of the joy of Christianity. And the Christian could have responded, yeah, and when you go out and get drunk like you do, what happens the next morning? You feeling the effects of that? What's happening to your brain as you do that? Yeah, you really enjoy that, don't you? Uh, and on and on you could go with the illustration but there's a joy in Christianity. We need to be expressing it to people in the world. It's sometimes, and preachers have used the, the statement, you know, we go out into the world and try and convert someone, and it's almost like, yeah, come and be miserable with us. Because that's the way we express ourselves many times to the world. Instead of, this is the greatest thing that there is. Uh, so, when we don't express that joy to the world, the being glad and rejoicing in the salvation that we possess, that people in this world don't, all of the blessings that we possess, people in the world don't. We do them a disservice as well as ourselves. Verse 10 then. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. And Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. We've already talked about... Oops, uh, The mountain, it's still that same mountain that's spoken of back in verse 6. That's the church. And the hand of the Lord is on it. Uh, here the idea, the hand of the Lord rest, is that God delivers it. God helps it. God protects it. All of those aspects are seen in God's hand is upon it. It's, it's basically saying, you know, putting a hand on a, someone's shoulder and saying, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. That's God in relationship to the Christian. But the same hand that protects and shelters the church. On the other hand, Moab shall be trodden down. So it's a destroyer of Moab. Now then, it's probably being used, or Moab is probably being used here to symbolize the spiritual enemies of God's people. It's being used in a figurative sense and not a literal sense. Uh, it's not that physical nation of Moab. Although, the reason that he's using Moab, probably, is that Moab represents their character. Now, we won't go back and read chapters 15 and 16. But there he deals with Moab and the destruction that's coming upon Moab because they are proud, they're arrogant, they're boastful people. Uh, just read, somebody read Isaiah 16 and verse 6. And then somebody else can turn over to Jeremiah 48 and read verses 28 through 30. But first, Isaiah 16 and verse 6. 
you've heard of their pride, he's very prideful, very arrogant. That's Moab. Somebody read Jeremiah 48, verses 28 through verse 30. think that God is expressing that they are a prideful people. Uh, he is exceeding proud. His loftiness, arrogance, pride, haughtiness of heart. Uh, as a result, stay in Ch Jeremiah 48 and read verse 42. Okay, he's magnified himself against the Lord. What's the result? He will be destroyed from being a people. They also, and somebody turn over to Zephaniah chapter 2 verses and read verses 8 through 10. As they were holding the dignity of men in contempt. Zephaniah 2, Zephaniah is the Old Testament, you know. Verses 8 through 10. Going through verse 10. The so here they've reproached and magnified themselves against God's people. Reproached my people. So that's the reason that they're going to be, along with their pride, destroyed. Now that's right, that's off the subject, uh, but he was uh, just simply the messenger, not so much him as the king. Uh, but God's always resisted the proud. There you, what does James 4 and verse 6 say? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Same thing is stated in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Thus, they will be destroyed. God is going to, as he puts it here, trod them down like straw for the dunghill. Or New King James has refuse heap. It's humiliation and judgment will be complete. Homer Haley wrote that a century later in Jeremiah's prophecy against Moab, Jehovah held out a promise of hope to the proud nation. Yet will I bring back the captivity of Moab in the latter days, and he puts in parentheses the messianic age, saith Jehovah. Jeremiah 48, 
47. But before Moab or people of any nation can participate in salvation, the spirit of haughtiness against Jehovah and his people has to be destroyed. And I think that's a good way in which we can end the class because we must exclude arrogance, haughtiness, pride from our life. We'll start with verse then 11, Lord willing, next week.